Greetings, cinephiles. Are you looking for a movie analysis podcast that stands above the rest? Then look no further than Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters. We analyze good movies, we analyze bad movies, and yes, we also analyze the in-betweens of the world of cinema. So if you like what you hear, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. And yes, my friends, we are 420 friendly. So when you listen to us, smoke smoke it if you've got got it. it. And now, here's a new episode of Collateral Gaming. The show starts right now. I'm Ashley Chancellor, and this is Collateral Gaming. Welcome to Collateral Gaming, the only video game podcast that matters, where we focus on good games, bad games, and everything else in between in the world of gaming. I'm podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, this is a 420-friendly podcast, so whatever you have, smoke it if you've got it. Or uh, in my case, you uh, you can also get some gummies. Uh, some of those Delta Gumbies, those are completely legal in, I think, most places. So, yeah. <laughs> well, folks, this is going to be another solo episode. Um, I don't think that either of my other co-hosts have played this game, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. And, uh, in fact, uh, Megan hasn't played any Fire Emblem games as far as I'm aware. Zach doesn't even want to touch Three Houses, and this game is adjacent to that, so I'm here on my own. But uh, if anyone out there is listening and wants to be on the podcast, is interested in, like, one-off episodes like this, you know, something upcoming, for real. Like, any, any new game that you're thinking about that you would love to talk about, I'd probably love to talk about it as well, so... Let me know. Hit, hit us up on the DMs, uh, on social medias. But anywho, today we're talking about Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes, or, or I'm talking about it. <laughs> I have actually been eagerly anticipating this game. I, uh, I, excuse me, I pre-ordered it. And by the way, this episode is probably going to be unedited, so. <laughs> but I pre-ordered this uh Actually, I think at least a couple months ago, because I was definitely wanting to talk about it. I felt like the timing was perfect, considering that we are doing a Fire Emblem episode, uh, and that is going to be our season finale. So, it felt appropriate that a Fire Emblem spinoff game is coming. Let's talk about it. I also played the hell out of Fire Emblem Three Houses. Uh, Not just in preparation for this, actually. I just really enjoyed Three Houses, so... (laughs) Well, we'll talk more about the Fire Emblem series as a whole, I think, on our next episode, but uh, we can definitely take advantage of this opportunity to go ahead and talk about Three Houses. I don't know, uh, at some point, you know, I I thought maybe we might make that a main episode. In fact, that was in the works for the next season, but like I said, Zach isn't a fan of this game. Well, he told me that he wasn't interested in trying it, and Zach, if you're listening, I told you this before, but I think you should give it a try, because Three Houses may actually be my favorite Fire Emblem game. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's the only one that I've actually beaten all the way through. Uh, That is, I've only played through the Crimson Flower route, but uh, I I have, in fact, finished the game. Um, I didn't accomplish hardly, you know, (laughs) I accomplished hardly any of what I wanted to do with my individual units. Uh, with the the supports and and what classes they ended up being, not everybody made it to a master class, but I did play through the story and I enjoy the hell out of it. And in fact, I've started other routes as well. You know, I've started my new game plus, uh, going again with the Black Eagles route, but this time I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make the opposite decision and do Silver Snow, uh, and then I also started just a brand new game uh, with the Golden Deer House. So <laughs> I'm excited about it. Uh, it's going to be really fun getting to know all of these other characters and units that I, you know, didn't get an opportunity to play with because I wasn't aware that if you don't recruit them, you may never be able to, you might end up killing them. So (laughs) 
Logic that also applies to Three Hopes, might I add. But uh, Three Houses is the latest Fire Emblem game to come out on the Nintendo Switch. It is the, the first game of the series to come on this Nintendo Switch. And let me tell you, it really modernizes Fire Emblem in a very big way. I mean, you've still got your traditional tactical RPG style of gameplay. You know, it's it's Fire Emblem as much as any other, but it does feel like a game of today's generation. It plays well. It looks great. I'd love to get into more detail and talk about it. Uh, if not for a main series episode, maybe in a bonus round, because it is actually a lot of fun. And I think the one thing that Three Houses does really, really well is uh, class organization. Class organization is excellent in Three Houses. Um, the class man management, I should say. You know, being able to uh, level up all of your units and, and find out the appropriate classes for them is is really, really important. And that plays heavily into into Three Hopes. So if you haven't had a chance to play Fire Emblem Three Houses, I fully recommend it. It's a great fucking game. And uh, I've had a lot of fun with it. I, I would love to get into the other routes. Dare I say, it probably would make more sense to play that one before this one. Three Hopes, I think, relies a lot on what happens in Three Houses. Um, but uh, I, I guess that's all we'll say about the latest entry. I mean, obviously, there other things may come up on the podcast, but I'd love to save that for uh, a future episode to really get into Three Houses. And I'd love to talk about Three Hopes. So Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes is the latest Warriors slash Musou style spinoff. Uh, especially regarding a popular Nintendo franchise. I will add that it is pretty much exactly uh, what Age of Calamity did for Breath of the Wild. Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes does for Three Houses. So <laughs> that that's really actually the best way to put it. Uh, Three Hopes is the Age of Calamity to... Uh, to three houses. In fact, I think it's interesting that both Zelda and uh, Fire Emblem both did the same thing with their Warriors spinoffs. Uh, they had the first game, Fire Emblem Warriors, Hyrule Warriors, focus on the series as a whole and, and implementing characters from all over the timelines and, and from multiple different uh, titles in the series all coming together. Whereas the... And then, and then they later on did a second game that actually focuses exclusively on the latest title on the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> so very, very interesting. Um, so if, if you're aware of the distinction between with what, you know, between Hyrule Warriors and Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, there you go. That's what Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes does. So uh, in a lot of, you know, in the same way that Age of Calamity, I felt like despite being a prequel, heavily relied on having played Breath of the Wild and being aware of that story, quote unquote's prequel, right? Uh, Three Hopes is the same way. Because Three Hopes is the, the best way to put it is it is an alternate route. So, you know, you have your Crimson Flower route, your Verdant Wind route, your um your uh, uh, Azure what 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 were all the routes in three in three houses? There was the Blue Lions, the Golden Deer, and the Black Eagles, and then there's the church as well. Uh, let me look it up. That way, at least I sound like I know what I'm talking about. Alrighty, one second, guys. So Azure Moon, Azure Moon, that was Dimitri's route. Okay, cool. So uh, this game, Three Hopes, actually has its own set of routes. Um, but you can you can basically consider them all uh, just separate routes. You know, a lot of people were wondering where does Three Hopes take place in regards to Three Houses because we knew it was connected. Is it a prequel? Is it a sequel? Is it an interquel? There was definitely some talk about you know maybe this game takes place during the time skip, kind of like the Ash and Wolves DLC did, which I haven't had a chance to play by the way. But uh, no, actually, this occurs concurrently. It is a it is an alternate route. Uh, I'm not even going to go so far as to call it like an alternate timeline, like you would say for Age of Calamity. It is it is uh, because Fire Emblem Three Houses was already separated into four routes, so these are an additional uh, three or four routes. In fact, actually, I think there's just three, and then there there are um, a couple secret chapters that you can unlock. By the way, I haven't beat this game yet. 
Uh, I started the Black Eagle route. I've been playing as much as I can around my work schedule. I've been playing the hell out of this game, believe me. But I've also been playing a lot out of Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade because we're doing an episode on it. And I've been playing more into Three Houses so that I can understand these characters better. And so, you know, uh, but I, I, I'm into the the Black Eagles route, which is called uh, Crimson Crimson something or other. Let's see. Scarlet Blaze, not Crimson. Scarlet Blaze. I should know that. You see it like every time you save the fucking game. But I'm also, you know, I've also got some edibles and some twisted tea in me. So give me a break here. So <laughs> you have the Scarlet Blaze, which is your Black Eagles route. The Azure Gleam or Azure Gleam. Uh, which is going to be your uh, Blue Lions route with Dimitri, and then the Golden Wildfire, which is your uh, Golden Deers, like Claude. So those those are the three routes in this game. It plays. It's very very similar to Three Houses in that aspect. You're either going to work alongside Edelgard, Dimitri, or Claude. I'm an Edel stan. I'm sorry. I love Elle. She is uh, a fantastic character. I loved getting to know her. Um, does she make some questionable decisions? Yeah, I think a lot of people, a lot of people are gonna are are, are gonna hate me for for preferring that route. I mean, Claude is probably in a second for me because he's such a likable guy, and I think out of the three of them, he's probably the best person. But uh, I initially was attracted to the Black Eagles because it was the magic focused class, and you know I, I'm just a fan of magic and games, especially Fire Emblem. So, but uh, that that was initially attracted to them, and then I really wanted to romance Edelgard, so or Edelgard. I can't, I don't, uh, they, you know, the characters say it, so it, it is Edelgard. But anyway, so I've been playing the the Black Eagles route. I've been having a lot of fun with it, getting to know the characters. Of course, I, these are the characters that I'm most familiar with because they're the route that I played. So you have Bernadetta and Ferdinand and Linhart and Dorothea and Casper. <laughs> and Petra all you know just just fantastic characters they all have their own strengths and weaknesses and uh, I'm really glad that this game uh encapsulated their personalities so well but again I'm gonna add the relationships between characters the support conversations that you have they all make a lot more sense if you've already played three houses I think this game kind of it, it, it tries not to follow all of the same beats, and so it, it goes off of that, and it kind of assumes the player has an understanding. So, if you've never played a Warriors slash Musou style game before, I mean, they all pretty much play relatively the same. The, the base combat is the same thing. If you've played one, you'll understand. I'm not going to say if you've played one, you've played them all, but if you've played one, you know the basics for how you're going to play them all. It's a lot of button spamming. I mean, in this game, it's a lot of mashing Y. <laughs> uh, and yes, it does get repetitive. This game, I think, doesn't add uh, a lot more onto the classic Musou slash warrior style gameplay as some of the other more recent editions have. I mean, Age of Calamity went out of their way to implement a bunch of stuff. But I think that this game does implement a lot of the Fire Emblem aspects. In fact, it feels quite a bit more like a tactical RPG than Fire Emblem Warriors did, which I've also played some of the original Fire Emblem Warriors. I haven't gotten very far into it because it deals with a lot of characters and stories that I haven't played yet in the Fire Emblem series. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of still introducing myself to this series. <laughs> um, I, you know, uh, with the upcoming Blazing Blade episode coming up, I have started with that game and I've been working my way through. And so, um, yeah. And so I haven't played too far into Fire Emblem Warriors yet, but I can already tell that this game does a lot better job of playing like a tactical RPG, of feeling like a Fire Emblem game. It, it definitely feels like, again, it, it feels like it's just additional routes for three houses, except that, you know, the, the style of gameplay is is going to be more focused on hack and slash. It's, it's one player versus a horde of enemies. And, and it's capturing, you know, outposts and strongholds and, you know, defeating enemy generals. 
It's a lot of that. But this game, you know, kind of combines that with the tact tactical nature of Fire Emblem. So, you know, whenever you pause the game, this is something you can do in the Hyrule Warriors games as well. And in the first Fire Emblem Warriors, when you pause, you'll be able to uh, to order your unit, give your units orders and tell them where to go. This is important because this is what makes the game feel like a Fire Emblem game. And if you playing, play a lot of Fire Emblem games, you'll probably pause the game a lot to do this because you're going to send characters after the, after the enemy units that, you know, you'll send your units against the enemies that they have strengths with, avoiding the ones that they have weaknesses with. So one new thing that this game adds, and it is adding from Fire Emblem Three Houses, is the uh, ag adjutant system. Adjutant? I don't know. <laughs> so you can. It works actually pretty much exactly the way that the pair up mechanic works in the first Fire Emblem Warriors, but it does feel a lot more intuitive. I, I feel like, and uh, yeah. So so and and it doesn't really work very similarly to the way that the adjutants work in three houses in that game you know when you're on the prep screen you can assign adjutants to units and then they follow that unit all the way throughout they don't really do anything except for they might participate in follow-up attacks but they gain experience along with the unit so it's a way to get some of your bench units you know to uh follow some of your units this works completely differently so your your adjutants are going to be characters that um are usually going to be your playable units or in some chapters you will in the main chapters in particular you'll have some non-playable units but you can still give them orders um, and they'll you can go and tell them to do their own thing but you can also, if you don't really have anything, to them, anything for them to do and you want them to gain just as much experience, is you can have them become an adjutant for another unit. And so uh, they'll actually participate in the warrior special. They might pop out for some follow-up attacks. And like in Three Houses, they'll gain experience. But they can pop in and out as much as they want. And if, uh, and if, if both of them are playable units, then you can switch between the two of them you know, as you need to. So you can uh, take a character and attach them to a cavalry unit and then, uh, you know, have that cavalry unit carry them across the map and then switch back so that you can take advantage of weaknesses. Unlike three houses, the weapon triangle here is in play. Three houses kind of has the weapon triangle in that when you master uh, a more advanced class, you'll end up unlocking the skill that uh, that makes swords uh, weak against lances and lances weak against axes and axes weak against swords and so on. There are some other ones, um, but this game actually just fully implemented the weapon triangle. I like the weapon triangle. I always have. I think it's the one thing that holds back three houses for me because I'm just a fan of it. I think that it adds a lot more strategy to Fire Emblem. It's a reason why you'd want to send one unit over another one. And so I think that and in this game, I think it's essential because when you're picking your units, you're going to pick ones that are going to be strong against certain enemy types. Uh, what's really nice here is that the battalions from Three Houses have also been added and so in Three Houses, the battalions allowed you to perform gambits. It was an additional type of attack that you could do that generally came at no uh, cost to your character's health. They weren't engaging directly in combat, but they would just use battalions that were attached to them to, uh, to, to, to perform you know, attacks on enemies and immobilize them. And you, know, you only have so many charges, but it was a useful tactic that you could use in Three Houses. In this game, battalions work quite a bit differently. What they do instead is they just increase your resistances or your strengths against other types of enemies. So you might be tempted to give a unit a battalion that matches their weapon type. You know, give your sword unit a sword battalion, give your gauntlet unit a gauntlet or brawling battalion. But actually, what I found is that that may not always be what you want to do because it adds a tier... Each battalion adds a tier of strength over a given weapon type or unit type in some cases. And so it was actually more useful when in most maps you can only deploy four units to um, to give that unit a mastery over a different weapon type, give them a strength over you know, a different weapon or cover over their weakness. And so you could send that unit out or double up their tier you know, against a certain weapon type so you can finish the, the, the match more 
smoothly or the battle. So it's actually really cool how you can experiment with that. I liked giving the characters, you know, the additional weapon types that you saw them use in Three Houses because unlike Three Houses, when a unit is in a class, that class only has one weapon type. That's all they do. You know, there are some of the melee classes, unique melee classes, you know, like with the Lords that, and with uh, Byleth, or not Byleth, Shez, <laughs> the protagonist of this game, and pro- uh, presumably Byleth as well, if you end up recruiting them, that uh, can use magic alongside their their melee skills and combat arts. But uh, But for the most part, you know, other than some classes being able to use magic, you know, most... most uh, you there is only one weapon type for every single type of enemy and and reason and faith are, are also kind of matched in together if you're a magic type you can use both of those types of spells and the character already has their own move set or the class does i should say so each class has its own move set and then each character has their own unique ability and that's what separates each character. And some characters even have their own separate warrior specials, which if you've played any Warriors games before, the warrior special is, you know, when you hit the A button in this case, it's your special attack that they can do. And uh, what's nice about that is that you can usually activate it even when an enemy's attacking you or even, you know, uh, if you're in a position where you can't uh, do an attack combo, you can usually pull off a warrior special. And so that, that gauge fills up over time and then you can do it. And so, you you know, certain characters will have unique warrior specials if they're in a class that works with them, or, um, or they'll have a, a unique ability, usually triggered by, you know, pressing the ZR button on the Nintendo Switch. But some characters have more passive abilities. In fact, they all have some sort of passive ability in addition to whatever else. But it is really fun being able to experiment with that. And so each character can be almost any class, you know, it's subject to a lot of the same limitations that Fire Emblem Three Warriors was, you know, where uh, there are some classes exclusive based on gender, and then some characters have unique classes that they're going to excel in. And each character, unlike Three Houses, which had you sort of try to guess based on the character's strengths and put them in the class that best fits their needs based on uh, you know, the students coming to you with goals and whatnot. In, in this case, uh, it's actually laid out for you, and each character has a progression uh, of recommended classes that you can put them in. But you're not limited by that. You can put them in another class and gain mastery. In fact, you probably will, because once you gain mastery of a class, you can't gain any more experience in that class. And so it makes more sense to go ahead and, if you can't promote them to, you know, the next tier of class, to just go ahead and throw them in somewhere else, you know, maybe work on your magic a little bit. Or if you're a character that I know in Three Houses <laughs> employed a different type of weapon, I might throw you in a class uh, with, with that uses that weapon type and gain experience. Because whenever you, just like in Three Houses, when you gain clan, ma- when you gain clan class mastery, <laughs> you obtain certain abilities. Now those abilities are going to impact you. Uh, there are passive effects that are going to help your character in combat. And so another way that you can sort of, you know, customize each character is giving them the abilities that best fit their play style uh, and based on which class they're in. And some abilities are going to be specific to certain classes and some abilities can be carried over, which is going to be really nice if, uh, you know, that that's where that training this character up in this other class goes. One thing that Three Hopes can do that I wish Three Houses had had is ability to unlock or, or to uh, to gain class experience outside of combat. So you can actually throw your characters into training and you can train starting from like up to from four units up to I think at least 10 units at a time and you can train up their class mastery and it'll, it'll use one of your training points which I'll we'll get into here in a little bit, but uh, it allows you to, if you don't want to have to throw that character into another battle in that specific class again and again and again, you can gain class mastery without actually having to play in that class, which is nice. Or it helps you, you know, sort of get that little extra edge. Uh, another thing that you can do, which is has been featured in, you know, both of the Hyrule Warriors games I've played at least, is the ability to train up your units using currency to uh, increase their class. And so, you know, the, the less experience they have to go into the next, not class, the next level. So you can they can level up. Uh, the less experience they have to level up, 
the less it's going to cost. And so, and as you go up to higher levels, obviously currency is going to be, uh, it's going to be, there's going to be, it's going to be a bigger requirement and you can only train your units up to the level of your highest unit, but it pays off. So if you have one unit, for instance, your protagonist unit, Shez, most likely, but everyone may be different than me, uh, that is quite a bit higher than the rest. I experienced this issue with Link and Hyrule Warriors as well. You can train all your other warriors up to Shez's level. And so that's really nice. It allows you to, uh, you know, give your, you can give your units both uh, individual experience and class experience outside of combat. Uh, there's a lot you can do outside of combat. Uh, you have, similar to the way that Three Houses had the monastery that you're, that you're able to walk through in between story missions and what really helped flesh out that Fire Emblem game and made it more than just battle after battle after battle, this game also has a lot, uh, has you walk around your, uh, your camp, which isn't nearly as big as the monastery was, but it doesn't really need to be because all of the functions are there. You can go to shops and, and, and buy items that you need or buy gifts so that you can increase your support with other characters so that they can play better alongside you, or you can purchase weapons or you can go to the blacksmith and improve or, or reforge or repair weapons. It, it's really nice. Now, when I say repair, that actually applies to the rusty weapons. In fact, what's funny is in Three Houses, I think that was called forging. Uh, weapons actually repair in between battles. Durability only applies with for a single battle. So unlike Fire Emblem Three Houses or in, almost any other Fire Emblem game, uh, weapon durability only applies between battles. In fact, it only applies to the character's combat arts and the spells that they use. Another gameplay mechanic that I'm definitely going to talk about. But uh, to go off of, you know, the in between battles, there's a lot to do. Uh, in addition to being able to do all of those things, you have activity points that you can spend, just like in Three Houses. In fact, this game has training points that you use for the aforementioned class mastery mechanic that I explained earlier. You have that, and you have activity points, which are mainly used to uh, to in increase support between your units and to, uh, how do you put it? What, how do how do they, what do they how do they put it in the game? I think they call it their morale. Yes, to to raise up their morale, which works a lot similarly to the way it does in Three Houses, except instead of making those you know units more capable of learning or more willing to to or gave you the ability to increase their growth in certain weapon types instead or or you know what do they call them categories. Instead, uh, this just improves their performance in battle. And so it, it, it helps out to try to, to you know, give morale to each unit by either giving them gifts or, or using these activity points to go out on expeditions, to do chores, to do kitchen, uh, to make dishes. Again, just like in Three Houses, you know, you can make dishes and those also have additional effects in battle. So there's a lot to do in between battles and, uh, and, and, and that's in between any battle. So you have your main chapter battle at the end of every chapter, but on the way there, you're going to be engaging in various other types of battles, which are kind of more similar to what auxiliary battles were in Three Houses, although what they call aux auxiliary battles in this game is also something different. That's just replaying previous chapters. <laughs> Uh, but in this game, there are other battles that you can partake in. You're going to have to do some of them, but you can sort of beeline your way to the to the end of the chapter if you so want to and not do all of the other uh, battles along the map. But if you do decide to clear the map, it's really satisfying because you've got this world map mechanic and you can freely go between the camp and the world map in between battles. And, and when you're on the world map, you know, you sort of see yourself taking the down territory by territory. And each time you... you you engage in a battle, you take over that territory, and then there are a few other, you know, little story bits that you can engage in. You know, you'll just kind of hover over this house, click on it, and you'll gain supplies, which you can use to upgrade your camp, or you'll gain items that you can use in battle. And you can upgrade your camp. That's what's going to allow you to train more units at a time, or to be able to uh, forge better weapons, or or repair better types of weapons, or the shop or the armory are going to sell different types of uh, items and weapons. There is a lot to do. Every single facility has multiple expansions that uh, that you pay for by gaining these these supplies. 
And so it, it is really worth it. In fact, even to take all your characters to the advanced class and get that advanced class promotion, uh, you have to unlock that with the training instructor. So it's through by upgrading that facility. <laughs> so there is a lot to do there. And it is a lot of fun being able to take, you know, it, it takes what I loved about three houses and, and, it, and it does that, you know, just as well, you know, even for a Warriors game. Brave warriors of Adrestia, the time has come to demonstrate the Empire's valor. We strike at the Imperial Army today. The party's already starting, huh? We have to figure out exactly where we stand in this war. Who knew the Ashen Demon had that kind of strength? Yeah, not. I can't believe one fighter could turn the tide of an entire battle like that. You'll we'll claim victory over that monster together. I have to keep fighting. Dying is without productivity. Have you ever read any chivalric romance? I think they're a fascinating group of people myself. But what do you make of them? Let's link up. Are you ready? Do try to keep up. Back at you. The best way to honor my fallen comrades is by training hard and growing even stronger. Where do these powers come from? Power itself is neutral. The good or evil comes from the one who wields it. One day that sword might overtake me, and I'll turn into a monster. Not so fast, you two. Defeating the Ashen Demon. Everything starts from there. <laughs> My dear partner in destiny. Like it's something we were meant to do. I'll let my sword do the talking when I cut the Ashen Demon down. What, yeah, what, what I like about this game is that, you know, it, it takes a lot about making each of those individual units, which in the last game as the teacher, you know, you were just kind of their, their students that, uh, their, your students that you were cultivating. In this game, you're technically another student, although you end up getting recruited into the war and you don't spend very long at the monastery at all. <laughs> and you end up... Uh, you know, just kind of working alongside them. But in the same way, this character, Shez, who is another uh, mercenary type and has a rivalry with Byleth, by the way, the Ashen Demon, you know, also kind of serves as as a front runner and, and somebody that is important to all the units and inspires them, I think. And so you're still, I think, kind of taking that role of molding each unit you know each character into the into the ideal unit and into the class that they're going to go in oddly enough some of the classes don't really work with what the characters excel in or or, or were supposed to be quote unquote supposed to be i mean they can be any class you want but in three houses for instance you know casper is very clearly a war master you know he has a goal that he even gives you telling you to, he wants to be trained up as a war master and he has both the ax and the brawl skills, but this game focused pretty much on his ax skills. And so his recommended class path actually has him end up being a, a wyvern master. So go figure, <laughs> by the way, three houses fucked this up. Wyvern master and wyvern Lord should be swapped. Okay. And I, and in the original Japanese, apparently they are Wyvern master is Wyvern Lord and Wyvern Lord is Wyvern master. <laughs> and I know why, because the class that we've been calling, uh, Wyvern Lord 
which originally in Japanese was, was Wyvern Master, has been translated as Wyvern Lord for so long, even though it's not a Lord unit. But it just bothers me so much because, you know, all of the other characters, Edelgard has a unique class called the Armored Lord. Dimitri has a unique class called the uh, the High Lord. And you would think that Claude would be the Wyvern Lord. No, he's the Wyvern Master. And there's a... And, and, and the, the Wyvern Lord is a class in the mas- is a master class <laughs> available to any male character. So, you know, those should be that would make a lot more sense if Wyvern Master was the master class and Wyvern Lord was the class that is unique to one of the game's lords, but whatever. <laughs> Just a minor nitpick that bugs the shit out of me. But yeah, you can and so in your main lord character Edelgard or Claude or Dimitri uh, they are going to have their own unique class progression as well. In fact, uh, Shez also has their own unique class, the Flugel, and I, and, and even one more class towards the end, which I'm not going to spoil because, well, one, I haven't gotten there. And number two, this is the spoiler-free episode being a game launch review. So, yeah, we're not going to get into spoilers here. But, uh, yeah, no, Shez, the main protagonist in this game, has a unique class called a Flugel who wields two swords. But they actually, their recommended advanced class is just a regular swords master, and then they have a master class that's unique to them. And I'm assuming Edelgard will have, you know, after Armored Lord, you can go to Fortress Knight. That's her next recommended path. And then I'm assuming the last one is going to be Emperor, just like it is in and uh, three houses and I'm assuming that this is going to be after uh, some sort of time skip that is my guess like I said I haven't completed the game yet as far as the story goes I actually think it does a little bit of a better job than three houses did with these characters I mean again I think that it relies on three houses a lot and being aware of those characters for instance I had no idea who the hell these Ashen Wolf characters were because I didn't play that DLC. <laughs> so <laughs> these characters aren't very familiar to me, uh, along with the characters from other routes, but these characters even less so. So uh, like I said, that, that's important. But um, yeah, no, I think that this game does a better job. Uh, the characters are definitely more likable, I want to say. Um, and, and for some reason, I guess, and this maybe is a little bit of a of a... Of a downgrade i think some people will feel like but uh at least edelgard's you know overall her motivations and 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 her plans and you know does seem to be she she does seem to be more relatable like you're supposed to empathize with her a little bit more whereas you know she was a little bit more questionable in three houses some people may like that more um apparently i've heard some people say that claude is a little bit more devious in fact i think i know what they're talking about you know he's less of a trickster and more of a you know hey this dude is (laughs) scheming and lying like wow what a dude but you know he's still really likable and i guess in his route you'll enjoy you know getting to know him or whatever so i think most people will easily attach to whichever house they identified with in three houses or or that they they liked the best in three houses and they're gonna go forward with that class in three hopes and if you're hoping to do that then you'll be pleasantly surprised i feel like it's gonna feel like an extension of that but in a route where Byleth doesn't come into contact. Instead, this character, another mercenary type, Shez, does. Now, Shez actually faces the Ashen Demon very early in, in the game that she actually, she, he or she or they are actually the tutorial boss. And so Shez actually has a motivation, has this rivalry and this this need to take down Byleth or whatever you decide to name them. And by the way, you can name Shez and Byleth and, and you can pick their gender. So you have all of those options available to you. You know, for me, I gave Byleth the same name that I gave her in my three houses. And I made her a girl and I made Shez a girl too. I like playing as girls. I don't know. I think that they're... Uh, I definitely like Byleth better as a girl. Byleth actually talks in this game, not just in, you know, whenever they level up or whenever they get like a, a critical hit. No, they talk. They have a full story. They have support conversations I am have heard. Again, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but um, yeah, no. Byleth actually talks and has a bit of a personality. They, they, they branch off of the existing character that we had, which was this mysterious, uh, emotionless 
mercenary, but you know, actually with with voiced roles. And Shez is not a silent protagonist either. Shez has their own personality as well, which comes you know into play in the story and can be molded somewhat by the the uh, dialogue choices that you make. So I'm really impressed with that. I love how they put Byleth into basically an antagonist role, and. Uh, you know, but at some point, I believe that they are going to be possible to recruit based on the choices that you make in the game. So there are a lot of branching story op paths here and, and things to do. So on top of having, you know, each of having the three routes in the game, there are also going to be differences in the story and the outcome of the story based on, you know, who you recruit and what happens. Speaking of recruiting, if you wanted to pick up some characters from other houses, some of them are recruitable, just like in three houses, some of them are recruitable. And it's not so much a, you know, if you did, you need to win their desire to join your class by upgrading some of these traits or, and, and then they'll, they'll join your side. It's, it's not that. And in this case, it's more like in the war phase. In fact, this game is almost all war, uh, of, uh, three houses where you know you're going to face them in battle but prior to starting a main chapter battle the the final battle of each chapter you actually gain these uh strategy points you know these, these resources that you can use to employ strategies and one or two or three of those strategies are always going to be recruit an enemy general and so it doesn't allow you to recruit every character from every other house or or faction but what it does allow you to do is recruit some of them, the ones that you're going to face in battle. And so if you choose to spend the resources, and I would recommend doing it because it's another free unit, <laughs> and it's it's probably going to be a, a, a more effective use of your you know, strategy resources than a lot of the other things are, then you can do that. But you can also use these points to, and that's a predetermined set of points, to, uh, to give yourself an advantage in battle. And some of these seem to be more intended and be more... Uh, unique to each chapter and some of them are kind of just more general like you know place a healer here or place a certain type of non-playable unit here that will help you and so and those strategies are gathered by how many how much you explored the the war map before you went on to the chapter so the more you explain the expand the map the more strategies that you're going to have to employ in battle and so that's really important and and it's going to be necessary i will say this game feels very easy for me uh that was my only complaint and that's why i and that's whenever i was playing on normal i ended up over leveling my units very quickly <laughs> and battles became very easy where i was taking down enemies with you know one type of special attack so I think it would be a little so I think it would be better to play the hard route if you're somebody that's played a warrior style game before. Uh, I, I would recommend actually playing on hard. I switched to hards most more recently because the game just felt too easy to me. It was starting to just but what I do like though is that the game pulls you in so many different directions at once. So many things are happening. And if you've played the last few Warriors spinoff games, you might be more familiar with this because with the ability to add orders, they've introduced a lot more side missions. And so you can order your units to go do this or go do that. And so there'll be multiple things happening at once. And sometimes the uh, defeat condition is, you know, the enemy just reaches this point and you weren't keeping an eye on that. And then it's game over. So there, the, while the combat difficulty leaves much to be desired, at least on the normal setting, the game can throw some surprises your way. And it's still a lot of fun and it's very rewarding to play. It does suffer from that typical Muso tedium, I will say. Like I said, there's a lot of button mashing and this game has even less in the real-time combat to differentiate itself. But if you're really into Fire Emblem... I think, and you've played a lot of those other Fire Emblem games, I think you'll like switching and moving into the map screen and ordering your units to go places. And so even when you're not directly controlling that unit, you're 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 still controlling them just as you much you would in a Fire Emblem game. <laughs> so that's how I, I say, you know, the game does employ a lot of strategy. And and you know, some of the chapters even have multiple ways to go about and do that. You know, do you wanna walk over these traps and and uh, hurt your units and just make your way as quickly as possible to this stranded force 
you can do that, or you can kind of go about it the smarter way, and if you employ the right strategy in battle, you can give yourself a little bit more time. I'm putting it a little bit more difficult than it ended up being, <laughs> but... <laughs> But yeah, like with Three Houses, I think the thing I like most about this game is the ability to train each of your individual units up and turn them into a an absolute powerhouse and, and figure out their strengths and, and equip them with the best skills and ability and combat arts that are possible. Uh, combat arts, I said I would talk about that. So combat arts in Fire Emblem Three Houses, and also I believe they were in Echo Shadows of Valentia. If they were in a previous game before that, I don't know, I haven't played it. But uh, combat arts were s something that in Three Houses allowed you to use a little bit more of the weapon's durability, but you could inflict more damage or increase your hit rate or increase your range. So combat arts were, were integral into allowing characters to finish off units or, or fight units that they wouldn't normally be able to. And it helped, you know, better customize each of your individual characters by equipping them with different combat arts. In this game, each character can be equipped with two combat arts or spells, depending on what type of character they are. And they use up, though that that's what uses up your durability. And there are ways to increase the durability in battle by picking up certain weapons. But for the most part, your durability is set, you know, based on the weapon. And you can increase a weapon's durability by forging it or by getting a better weapon. And so by, by doing that, you can, uh, yeah, you can use combat arts more in battle. Some combat arts or spells are going to use more durability than others. They have different elemental abilities. Some of them are going to, just like in Three Houses, uh, allow you to have an advantage against certain types of classes, such as flying units or mounted units. So it is actually worth checking out and equipping the character with the combat arts. You know, you may even, like me, go into each battle and equip the character with different abilities or different arts or spells based on what you know units are present on that map and even if you can't see the unit on the map the game will actually tell you there'll be a little exclamation mark showing okay hey is a monster going to show up here a monster's going to show up here speaking of monsters uh those are back the same huge units from three houses which you pretty much had to use gambits to take down there are no gambits here instead uh, each monster has going to have like three or four different strengths or three or four different, sorry, not strengths, the opposite of that weaknesses. And so when you fill up that gauge, you're able to perform a finishing move on them just like you can with enemy units. And so you can take a portion of their health bar and they have like multiple health bars. So uh, the monsters also play a big part in this game. They're like your giant boss battles in other Warriors games. And they're very much like the monsters in th three houses. So they're actually a good fit here. Speaking of finishing moves, those are here. They work very similarly to the way that they work in Age of Calamity. You can, uh, you, 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 when you hit an enemy general or a giant monster boss with a certain type of combat art or attack, you're going to reveal the stun gauge. You take the stun gauge down and then you press the strong attack button just like an Age of Calamity to execute a finishing move, which not only finishes off that enemy, but all of the enemies in the area or in, the, in the, that surrounding area, which is really nice. So you can take out you know, both the stronghold captain and the unit that you were going after all in one swipe. It's really, really satisfying and it's nice. And every character has a unique finishing move as well, or at least every class does. Uh, what class each character is in is mostly going to determine their moveset and their combos. They're, all, you know, and, and even upgraded classes are going to play similar. A paladin plays fairly similarly and has a very similar uh, moveset to the cavalier. So each char so if, if you're moving the character along their recommended path, class path, then uh, which is graciously highlighted for you, then that character is going to play a lot similarly from character to character. In fact, what I what was really a nice touch is, for instance, the mounted units. When you unmount, they play just like the uh, the soldier type does. So <laughs> it, that was actually kind of nice. So I, I really enjoyed that. I'm still getting a feel for all of the characters' special move, you know, all of their their move sets, all of their combos. But it, it works just like it does in any other Warriors game. You know, you have your uh, basic attack combo, you have your strong attack, and then you have, you know, your 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 various combos by hitting the strong attack button in the middle of a basic combo. So again, it works 
just like it does in any other Warriors game. But anywho, I, I guess that's really most of what there is to say about Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes. I know I sort of ranted there about all of the game mechanics, but I tried to kind of approach it from someone who maybe has never played a uh, Warriors game before, or and maybe even someone that's never played a Fire Emblem game before, and you know, explain that in detail, but it is a lot of fun. I've been enjoying the hell out of it. Uh, I think for the first time in a while of playing the game, I finally started to find it, kind of feel the tediousness of it. And I was like, well, let's go ahead and record this episode. But <laughs> that's not to say I'm done with the game. I just, you know, I wanted to get this out by a certain day. And I, I feel like I've played enough to uh, to have a first impressions, you know, spoiler free review of it and I'm absolutely satisfied I think the game is everything that I wanted it to be and more it is going to be a strong recommendation more so than the first Fire Emblem Warriors game by a lot even though I haven't played a lot of that one this game just rocks and I've heard a lot of people talking about how it feels like a Fire Emblem game it really does despite being a Warriors game if that's not your cup of tea, if you're not a fan of the hack and slash genre or other Muso games, then you're probably not going to have a lot of fun with this. I'm not going to recommend you drop 60 bucks on a brand new game for something that you're not going to enjoy. But if, in fact, I really don't recommend this again unless you've played Fire Emblem Three Houses, and and, and you know, and you are, well, yeah, either you've played Fire if you've that, that's a requirement. I think you should have played Fire Emblem Three Houses. Whether or not you've played other Warriors games before doesn't really matter because you can get introduced to you know to the genre through this game as well as any other Warriors game. But you know, going back and playing some of the older ones, you know, you might feel a little bit disappointed. I'm not sure. I haven't really played any of the of the actual like mainline Warriors games. The only ones I've played are the Hyrule Warriors ones. And, and and this one, uh, I think there was that that Attack on Titan game was made by the same team, if I'm not mistaken. But that doesn't really play a lot like a Warriors game does, at least not in my opinion. <laughs> so, Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes is a lot of fun. In fact, you know, I I, I would go so far as to call it a solid eight out of ten. It, it's 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 a hell of a time. Uh, it's worth investing your time into. You may pour a lot of hours into this game. If you care about the characters of Three Houses, then you should definitely play this game. So, that being said, our next episode is going to be on Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade, also just known as Fire Emblem in the United States. It is the game that came out on the GBA that was called Fire Emblem when it came out in the States and was retroactively subtitled uh, The Blazing Blade officially as its English title later on uh the game featuring you know the lords lynn elliewood and hector that is a prequel to fire emblem six this is fire emblem seven it's a prequel to the binding blade we're going to be doing our season finale on that game and i'm really excited to talk about it because that was my you know my foray into the fire emblem franchise and it's actually a great starting game for that because it has a a good tutorial segment and we'll talk about that next time but we're gonna have a two-part episode on that also, I would love to get another bonus round out. My thoughts are game recommendations. I, we haven't done one this season. I'd love to do another game recommendations episode. But we'll see. As far as the rest of the season goes, I'm planning to, you know, kind of uh, after the Fire Emblem Blazing Blade, you know, those are, that's going to be the end of our numbered episodes. But uh, we're opening back up in September. Until then, I want to continue to release bonus round content as well as uh, game launch reviews. I definitely want to do that. I definitely want to continue with that trajectory and continue to talk about new games that are coming out, as well as our more topical type episodes. Uh, maybe get caught up on those commentaries. That would be great. And, and uh, you know, do some more for our patrons. By the way, if you haven't checked out our Patreon, we have exclusive video game Let's Play commentaries there. And uh, we'll be adding more as more interest in it grows. Like I said, we do have one more patron, so... For you, we are definitely going to release more content so that you feel like you've gotten your money's worth. Of course, we still have, there's still a shit ton of of, uh, of episodes already as it is. But uh, yeah, during the interseason break, I'm definitely going to be focusing on that. I would love to do 
a, uh, a Let's Play on a Fire Emblem game. If you guys want to let us know what you think about, you know, and what Fire Emblem game would be great for a Let's Play, please do. You know, I'd like to do something different than what we're going to be doing an episode on. I'd love to, you know, give one of the other games some focus. I think that would be cool. So let us know if you have a recommendation for that. And that way, you know, we can play through it. It For the Fire Emblem, it might be better to play through the game one time first and be pretty aware of it. But it might also be cool to kind of be checking it out with me for the first time as well. So, yeah, let me know what you guys think. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Those are our social media. Check out our Facebook group, Collateral Media Podcasts, as well, where you can also interact with Collateral Cinema co-hosts, Bo and Robert, and myself, of course. You can find Collateral Gaming on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Again, check us out on Patreon. Check us out on social media. And uh, if there's anything that you would like to add, you know, you'd like us to talk about on the show, please approach us. If you want a guest, if you want to send us a promo, I'm really looking for those opportunities and, and would love to. To, to work with you, fellow podcasters, gamers, streamers, whatever. On the Collateral Cinema side, we had our season finale on Sidekick starring Chuck Norris, and we also just got out a director's cut commentary on Demonic Toys. That was a lot of fun doing that with Bo and Robert. Um, we actually were microdosing on mushrooms, so we had a fucking blast, man. <laughs> Let me tell you. So, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or feedback on your platform of choice. And I guess that's really all there is to say. So, I've been Ashley Chancellor. This is Collateral Gaming, and I am out. Collateral Gaming is a collateral media podcast. All music and game clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.